Hey, good morning. How are you? Thank you for coming. Today I'm going to show you, in case you had not noticed, the readings that I posted. Some are from the textbooks, other, others are, are links to uh, online readings. Then I'm going to continue with the program from Monday. That is to say, I'm going to complete my analysis of chapter seven, read from chapter eight, and then switch to the discussion of the paper and the page where the template, recommended template for the paper can be found. Just a quick announcement about the office hours. Today, my program, like many others during campus lifetime, is offering a virtual open house. I'm referring to the program in globalization. In our case, it is scheduled to start at 12.30. Normally, I have office hours in my office between 12 and 12 noon and 1 p.m. In case you need to talk to me come before 12.30. I might be available after 12.30 if no one comes into the Zoom room, but if people show up, I have to uh, interact with them. Of course, I'll be available tomorrow on Zoom as usual for the virtual office hour between 4.30 and 6 p.m. Make sure you schedule an appointment for that. If you go to the previous week, after the class on Friday, I posted readings, additional chapters from the text, one more chapter from the textbook entitled Machiavelliana, and as promised, I posted the link to an article on the talented Mr. Ripley, the film that we watched for two Fridays from a volume, a collection of essays about Patricia's Heis Patricia Highsmith's novel and their rendition on the screen in films. At the end of this week, I added new readings. Next week, our Machiavellian text will be a novella from 1914 entitled Benigna Machiavelli, written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And therefore, to prepare for that, start reading the excerpts that I posted in this wiki, and you find them there. And there are two sets of excerpts from this novella. As previously announced, on Friday, we will watch a few scenes from another uh, film devoted to a different book in the series with this character by Patricia Heisman, and that is Ripley's Game from 2002, directed by Italian director Liliana Cavani, and starring John Malkovich as Tom Ripley, as a much older Tom Ripley. So, a lot you have already found about chapter seven in the videos that we placed uh, last week's uh, Wednesday's class when I was ill and uh, I couldn't come to class. I just want to go back to chapter seven for a couple of considerations just to emphasize the important aspects of this chapter, which is vital to the whole understanding, to the understanding of the whole book, the prince, because after all, Cesare Borgia is proclaimed to be the official ideal model of leadership. At least this is what we read at the beginning of the chapter. At the end of the chapter, you find a, a different point of view uh, and a harsher kind of judgment 
rendered on Cesare Borgia as somebody who was ultimately responsible for his own political failure. How was Cesare Borgia the ideal prince? You know that the two essential aspects in the use of power are influence and force, with a strong consideration given to this intermediate form, intermediate between influence and force, which is deterrence. Deterrence relies on the potential use of force, meaning I have force that I can deploy, don't attack me, I can use the force that I have simply to intimidate my enemies or competitors. At the same time, I can also use influence as deterrence. That's why I placed it in the middle. So, in reference to force, deterrence means, take the example of the Cold War. The Cold War was not fought directly by the two countries involved, the USA and the Soviet Union, because each country had such a military force, and in particular, they had such an arsenal of uh, uh, atomic bombs that uh, could be quickly transported on their target using missiles, that their force acted as reciprocal deterrence, right? Don't attack me because I have this force that I can deploy in retaliation, and also there is no way that your uh, uh, preemptive attack will destroy all of my missiles because I have them in silos in the ground uh, protected by concrete. I have them also uh, on submarines that are so deep into the sea that you, you cannot uh, destroy them. Fine. In reference to influence, deterrence means something else also. I can prevent an enemy from attacking me because the enemy, and this is repeated many times in chapters one, two through six, because the enemy can see how much support I get from my subjects. And therefore, it'll be much more difficult to defeat me because of the support that I have from my subject. And, and in this case, the obvious example would be the war in Ukraine, which is not being won by Russia exactly because it is not about opposing armies. It is not about force. It is about the generalized support that the Ukrainian government gets from the population, from the international community, and, and therefore uh, they are, in fact, they were a more formidable adversary that Russia had thought Russia should not have attacked altogether. Right? And, and they find themselves in a critical situation as much as on, on, with different issues as much as Ukraine itself. How was Cesare Borgia masterful, a master in the use of this? Well, in terms of influence, really, there is one significant example that is the example of Remiro. But before that, you have to consider how influence played a part in establishing the political and military career of Cesare Borgia, in that Cesare Borgia was the son of the Pope. And therefore, influence plays a part because Cesare Borgia is allowed to conduct his campaign under the umbrella, under the shield, the aegis of his father's political and diplomatic connections, especially the connection, the alliance between his father, Pope Alexander VI, and the King of France. In reference to the example of Remiro, Remiro is a vital example to understand how force, the use of force, should be used in a limited way when it's necessary, when it's necessary to control the outcome or to neutralize an enemy, and then you need to switch to influence. You cannot just continue to use force. It is too expensive. At some point, you run out of resources. Again, keep in mind that the reasoning I just offered to you does not include any moral consideration. But I'll go back to the issue of morality 
in a few minutes after that. In the case of Remiro, if you remember the episode after Cesare Borgia has established control through a military campaign of an area in northern Italy, in the Italian northeast, south of Venice, after he established his control and created what really looked like a small kingdom, a small state that incorporated different city-states, there was, as an aftermath of this victorious campaign, there was turmoil, right? He was the new leader of city-states that had been independent for a very long time. Some of them had been city-states for 200 or 300 years, right? So the previous governments had established a presence that guaranteed their influence upon the population. So in order to establish control inside, the outside enemies had been defeated or eliminated by Cesare Borgia, including the notorious Senigallia ambush, where he called in his enemies and had them eliminated. But internally, within those states, it was necessary to establish control. Influence was on the side of the previous leaders, of the previous governments, of the previous political institutions. Therefore, there was no other way than to, record, than to resort to the use of force. And Cesare Borgia did it indirectly by placing as the head of this new state a uh, uh, close collaborator, Remiro de Lorqua, who was also a uh, forceful leader. So Remiro used jail, torture, physical elimination to establish control, to establish a solid presence of the new government in those states, right? And to make sure that no one could mount an effective opposition. He used force either to eliminate the adversary or to intimidate the others, right? Deterrence plays always a part. He didn't kill everyone, right? You kill enough that the other are deterred, uh, are intimidated into submission. Then Remiro himself was killed. And one day the population in one of those city-states wakes up to find the gruesome scene of the body of Remiro split into using a butcher's wedge, right? Because when you have a big animal, you, you cannot just rely on, on a big knife. You also have to have other instrument to break the, the, the skeleton of the animal. And Machiavelli himself was there. Machiavelli himself was possibly an eyewitness. He writes back a letter to Florence about the episode describing the gruesome scene. And yet when Machiavelli was there, he couldn't understand what was going on. Later on, 10 or more years later, when he wrote The Prince, he had this intuition. What was the episode about? Well, Cesare Borgia had just transitioned from force to influence in a masterful way because he associated the use of force with Remiro and played the part of the paternal leader to establish his influence. That is to say, the game played by Cesare Borgia at the expense of the life of someone who was a collaborator, maybe possibly even a friend, according to Machiavelli, the game was the following. Cesare Borgia pretended, uh, claimed, that he didn't know anything about the violent campaign of uh, elimination and intimidation mounted by Remiro de, Lor de Lorqua about the use, the excessive use of force. And he claimed that once he was alerted that his governor was being so violent, had been so offensive. I'm using offensive as a Machiavellian term where offense is the use of force against the citizen, uh, offendere, offesa, are the terms used by Machiavelli. He claimed that he didn't know anything about this. And once he was alerted that Remiro was so unfair, so violent, so forceful in his leadership, 
he proceeded to punish him and establish this way a strong reason for the population to love him, right? It was like a bad cop, good cop kind of game. I didn't know anything about him when I knew about his evil ways. I intervened, therefore, you have now reason to respect me, to be grateful to me, etc. So this way, first of all, Cesare Borgia used influence initially as a premise to his action because he delegated the use of force. So he created a distance between himself and whatever force was applied to that situation. Then he further reinforced his influence, his strategy based on influence by blaming Remiro entirely for the use of force after, after order was established, right? So you use force whenever it's necessary. And necessary means that, first of all, it will get you the outcome you're looking. And second of all, it will neutralize your opponent, okay? So going back to the silly analysis of the example of Will Smith will use force without neutralizing his opponent and use force in a way that was supposed to be symbolic, a deterrence, right? Don't do this, uh, don't try to do this, but you don't use deterrence after the opponent has attacked. That's not deterrent anymore, shows you, you your weakness. After the opponent has attacked, you can only go to war and then negotiate a peace agreement. You cannot, if, if you're attacked, just shoot your, your a shot in the air. That's useless, right? You, you can shoot in the air or you can show your artillery before the attack begins so that the enemy will say, well, maybe uh, I shouldn't be engaging in this campaign. So after order has been established in the new state of Cesare Borgia, he proceeds to remove the instrument of force as announcing in a very theatrical way through this public execution of sorts, announcing in a very theatrical way, the season of force has ended. The period of violence has ended and now you have peace, you'll have order, you'll have stability, and therefore you can benefit from my government, right? Because the idea through the chapter and in the entire book is that force is used in a necessary way only if, first of all, you obtain the outcome, you reach the outcome, you neutralize your opponent, right? You cannot use force and stop before the opponents are being have been neutralized, then it, your use of force is useless. However, there is a third condition for the use of force, that you use force to obtain a, an outcome that is overall positive for the state you're a leader of, for the community. And in Machiavellian terms, that's usually you use force in order to produce a state of order and stability that will have two effects. The first effect is order and stability will allow you the economy to prosper, will be, is the precondition for growth. And according to Machiavelli, in the end, uh, uh, money, uh, material goods, wealth, material wealth is what people in general, and therefore the subjects care the most for. And the second, effect is that once you have established order and stability, then you, you'll be able to uh, have a situation where the citizens have boundaries and therefore they'll behave honestly. Because that's the idea, uh, a key idea in Machiavelli, that the leader himself doesn't really have to follow any moral rules because after all, what are the consequences if you're a leader? Who's there to punish you? You can have an opponent who will uh, gain uh, uh, support if you ruin your image and affect your influence in a negative way, but otherwise there is no price if you momentarily deviate from morality for a cause. 
However, for the citizens, it is necessary for the citizens to have boundaries, and those boundaries are enforced by the leader himself, right? Because for the citizens, in a situation that is not a critical situation, a situation of chaos and war, but in a peaceful situation, if the citizens deviate from an honest and moral behavior in a way that affects the community or members of the community, their punishment will be ensured by the leader himself, right? And uh, the gregarious nature of the masses will ensure that no one can really rise to a level where they can be above the rules and therefore uh, escape punishment. I'm sorry, Nigel, you, you had something to ask or to add. Uh, I want to know, I just, wouldn't this hurt you, um, the prince in the, uh, in the uh, uh, mid midterm that uh, he's executing like one of his uh, lieutenants? They, like, wouldn't that hurt him uh, attracting new talent that could initiate violence on him? Absolutely. Attitude? And it's a very mafia-esque situation, right? You find that both in the fictional mafia of the films and in real life mafia, that at some point a friend will have you killed, right? You find that in the Godfather trilogy, other movies about the mafia, in, in the second Godfather, even one, even Michael's brother uh, will be killed, right? And in real life, uh, you have the memoirs of members of the mafia, such as Tommaso Buscetta, who was instrumental in helping Judge Falcone in the 1990s bring to trial hundreds, more than a hundred uh, mafiosi, including the upper echelon. They essentially dismantled a, 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 an entire part of uh, the organization. Tommaso Buscetta tells the story of being invited to a dinner, late dinner, as it is a typical of the Sicilian customs, uh, because Sicily is so hot during the summer that people might have dinner at 11 o'clock. In, in the countryside, because that's where you find the best ingredients, the best food, right? And they take him with a car to this dinner, and he's in the back of the car with two other guys in the front, and he's saying, this is it. This is the time they kill me. This is perfect, because they invited me. I have no reason to suspect anything. It's supposed to be a friendly celebration, but they know that I'm about to, uh, that I've entertained negotiations, that I'm about to, to switch side, and I'll be killed for sure and that doesn't happen, but he has that sense that this is in fact possible. And the way that is possible, it is harmful in the short term, maybe even the medium term, but uh, the way you recover from that is that you don't do it all the time. And exactly because you don't do it all the time, after a while people feel, feel reassured, forget about this possibility, it, has, it hasn't happened for uh, such a long time that they assume that uh, it it should not and will not happen again. Which is the same thing, that, the same kind of phenomenon we discussed in reference to cons and con artists. It is exactly when in uh, social circles where big money is present and therefore big cons uh, can be mounted based on trust based on the fact you've been admitted into this circle, you're a con artist, but because you're, you've been admitted into the inner uh, circle of some powerful individual, you can mount your, your attack against uh, him. And um, after a, a, an incident has occurred, then people in the elites will be more in, on guard against this, but exactly because they've been uh, uh, not trusting uh, others for a long time, this will expose them to new attack because in the end they feel reassured that whatever measure they have taken is sufficient. And it's like foxes and rabbits, right? You may have in any circle a growing number of uh, scamsters, of con artists, this will inc increase the mistrust, reduce the number of uh, con artists operating successfully in that circle, and that will generate more trust, a more trusting attitude that will allow 
the reinsertion of con artists in the same circle again. So it can be done if you do it strategically, right? And, and of course, you can assume that anyone would have been uh, worried about that happened. And again, keep in mind also that this is Machiavelli's hypothesis. We don't know for sure what happened between Ramiro and Cesare. And possibly it is not such an elaborate scheme. Possibly it is some kind of personal disagreement. But this is how Machiavelli reinterprets this incident, right? So we're not talking exactly about history or the facts, but how this example is, is played out to confirm Machiavelli's theory about influence and uh, force. Now, in reference to uh, Cesare Borgia's masterful use of the basic elements of power, keep in mind that even in the case of the facts of Senigallia, the ambush of Cesare Borgia's enemies and competitors who are invited to this town in order to negotiate a peace agreement and then they're killed one by one and physically eliminated, be careful not to uh, connect this fact only to the use of force in the form of violence. Because there is a lot of influence at play at the same time. It is, even in this case, a masterful combination of influence and force. Because without influence, those enemies would not have accepted the invitation, right? You cannot simply, right? Putin cannot simply invite Zelensky in Moscow. Zelensky would just not go, right? Putin has no trust. Zelensky would never uh, uh, trust Putin to uh, uh, observe the terms of an agreement. In this case, though, Cesare Borgia has enough influence upon his competitors that his word of honor is sufficient to have them come to Senegalia with a small escort such that could be easily overwhelmed and they be killed. So even the facts of Senegalia are a combination of influence and force. Now, going back to uh, the use of force in a variety of contexts, keep in mind that when Machiavelli celebrates Cesare Borgia as a model leader, and we see Cesare Borgia resorting to force, manipulation, evil ways, what Machiavelli in chapter eight will call force, will call, sorry, cruelty, right? With a negative term, right? With a term that is morally loaded. You have to understand the complex consideration Machiavelli has for this and the reasons why it would be a simplistic reduction of his ideas to simply say that Machiavelli provided an apology, a defense, an excuse for the use of cruelty, for the use of evil ways. Machiavelli is doing this within an intellectual framework that is different. That is to say, Machiavelli is saying that within any kind of specific context, whatever your outcome is, morality itself will probably not be relevant. Probably because there might be exceptions where moral considerations would have such a negative effect on your image and your power to uh, exercise influence that once you've ruined your image, it would take you too long to recover from that and you can rely on force alone. But otherwise, in general, Machiavelli is saying that you have to separate politics from morality. Now, this was the result simply of the evolution of culture from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, because the culture of the Middle Ages can be summarized uh, from, from this point of view, in this way, that within medieval culture, everything is connected to God, right? And therefore, if you write a political treatise during the Middle Ages, and, and you find several, right? They all include considerations that are connected to theology, to the Bible, 
right, to the scriptures and the laws of God. Those considerations, those ideas are incorporated in the treatment of politics because the idea within medieval culture is that God is the foundation of everything, not just the creator of the universe, but the foundation of everything uh, that is worthy of, of doing or thinking in life, right? And therefore, you cannot escape from that. Now, going from the medieval culture and its strong foundation on theology to modern culture, the idea is, is, is simply to separate every discipline, every area of culture from God and theology. And therefore, even politics has to be treated as secular science. And by doing this, the Renaissance humanism finds its way into the creation of mo modern disciplines in every field, including finds a way to create science once you have that uh, separation enacted, implemented. In the case of politics, the separation from morality or theology means that if you examine a political scenario, a political game, you have to take into consideration only what is relevant. What is that is relevant is the potential actions or reactions of the players involved in there. The interaction be between your skills and whatever context or set of circumstances you find in that context, right? So, our Machiavelli will tell you, it would be nice if reality followed the laws of morality. It would be nice if your opponents, for example, played fair. However, who's there to enforce their fair play? When it comes to higher level leaders, no one is there to force them to play by the rules. By definition, the leader sets the rules because there is no one forcing them to abide by any set of rules. Not even the rules of theology, not even the rules of the Bible, right? So religion or morality are not relevant in most political scenarios because no one will necessarily abide by those rules. And therefore you have to play your game based on the assumption that your opponents might be as cruel, as evil, as deceitful, as manipulative, manipulative as you can be or you will be. However, once you establish this in reference to the fundamental separation between politics in this case, science, philosophy, historiography, etc., from religion, that doesn't mean that religion does not exist. That doesn't mean that religion is removed from intellectual consideration altogether. It is the connection between politics and religion, politics and theology, that is eliminated. But that doesn't mean that religion by itself is not a legitimate field of intellectual thinking, of intellectual analysis, or that morality does not exist. Machiavelli is not saying there is no morality or morality has no value. He's just saying morality has no value within the political game if the uh, objective, if the goal of the political game is to obtain an outcome or, or to win in, simple, in simpler terms. Okay, but having disconnected these two areas doesn't mean that morality or religion have been erased, removed completely from the human experience. Therefore, at the same time, it is true that Cesare Borgia can be considered a winner to a certain point, that he become a loser himself. And is a winner and someone to be celebrated, to be uh, labeled as the perfect or near perfect example of leadership in spite of his reliance on cruelty and use of force, etc. In fact, according to Machiavelli, that use of force was necessary and, and therefore uh, is part of the success of Cesare Borgia. Yet, it is also true that 
when you move from the field of politics that you've disconnected from morality and, and religion to morality and religion, which still exist outside of politics, you can legitimately label Cesare Borgia as a cruel man. You can legitimately render a negative moral judgment of Cesare Borgia, or if you're religious, you can legitimately assume that Cesare Borgia will go to hell and will be punished for his human sins. You've just separated those areas, so within the field of politics, he's a successful politician. Within the field of religion, he's a sinner and a monster. Within the field of morality, is someone who was not moral. Edmund. Uh, yeah, just because, like, it's interesting that you say that, because um, excluding, like, morality from it allows you to make these uh, utilitarian games where you can actually analyze behavior and choice because everyone's trending towards their, their uh, utility. Um, yeah, it's like their economics. interest, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just like in economics, when you, because exactly. when, um, when you say all else is equal, so, uh, there's a lot of different service, something. Um, that's how, what allows economic, economists to make models and have game theory. And, and allows capitalism to work, right? right? Because this separation, of course there are forms of capitalism within the Roman Empire or within the Middle Ages. But this separation of morality and religion, remove them, removing them from being the foundation of society and individual and social behaviors and separating them from everything else creates also establishes the premise for the creation of capitalism, right? Where, whereby if you go buy uh, a, a jacket or uh, a, a chicken or a car, the transaction has nothing to do with morality, meaning you're not being sold the car at a certain price because you're moral and honest as opposed to another customer. Now, of course, there is an ethical foundation to uh, capitalism and uh, Weber, Max Weber and others investigated the connections between pro the Protestant view of ethics and uh, capitalism. But that view of ethics is vastly different from medieval ethics, right? Because it is not done for Protestant, Protestant ethics is based on the idea that you don't go to heaven or to hell because of what you've done, right? Uh, that, that's the essence of Martin Luther's view of religion. You're saved by grace. Either you're saved or you're not saved, but you cannot gain your salvation by acting morally with that goal in mind. So it's a different kind of ethical consideration, but the basis for capitalism is, it is not about the individual relationship between you and me. As the customer, I am to be treated like every other customer, whether you like me or not, right? That's the basis for capitalism, and that's obtained by removing a lot of uh, the, the moral values in the game in this kind of game or transaction. So make sure you have this more complex understanding of Machiavelli, even when Machiavelli is celebrating someone who's clearly evil, is not saying evil is good. It, it's not trying to sell you a t-shirt that said, be evil and keep, keep calm and, and be evil. No, you can be evil and go to hell, right? You can be evil, evil and be condemned by posterity. However, when it comes to the context, morality may not be relevant at all in reference to the outcome itself, and that outcome should have a, a, a positive downfall on society, and in a way, I've said numerous times, in a way, the, the Machiavellian leader is also a tragic figure because it's someone who might have to, in spite of his personal inclination, might have to do something evil or order something evil be done in order to obtain the goal for the benefit of society. So it's kind of a trade-off. The leader uh, uh, has to give up on his soul, right? And, and knows that he'll go to hell uh, for the good of the others. At least that is that possible interpretation. It's just a possible interpretation because 
when it comes to religion, things are complex. Even there, you find a number of books on Machiavelli's religiosity. And especially in the last 20 years, the consensus moves in the direction of thinking that Machiavelli uh, was a secular intellectual who uh, was at best agnostic in terms of religiosity or might have been an atheist altogether, okay? Now, the last thing I want to add about chapter seven is the demise of Cesare Borgia. Keep in mind that from the beginning, Machiavelli told you that Cesare Borgia is a good example when it comes to people who rely on their virtue, meaning their skills, and on fortune, because he was born the son of a pope, and therefore enjoyed the political connections provided by his father. At the end of his life, fortune played a part again, because fortune removed the influence provided by his father when his father died, and uh, at the same time, when his father died, Cesare Borgia himself was sick. According to some versions of the story, Cesare, uh, uh, Alexander VI was poisoned, which is possible. The hypothesis of poison is compatible with the description of the corpse, because after the death, as it was customary, uh, people paid homage uh, by, by walking in front of uh, a setup. They, they could see the corpse of the Pope. It, it was placed in a public uh, place for, for public homage, and therefore we have descriptions of the uh, swollen body, the color of the skin, etc. That's compatible with poison, that's possible. Uh, why we know for sure that is also fact that Cesare Borgia was sick uh, during that period uh, and remained sick for several weeks after his father's death. Uh, whether it was the flu or whether he was poisoned himself, that is another hypothesis that is mentioned by contemporaries, by uh, docu in documents. Uh, there is a famous novella telling you several stories, including the story of Cesare Borgia and his father at dinner. Uh, both are poisoned during this dinner, only the old man, being older and therefore frail, dies right away, and Cesare Borgia, being younger and in better health, survives, but only after several weeks of uh, sickness, right? It doesn't matter that fortune has given to Cesare Borgia with his birth and, and fortune takes from him at the end. However, it's not as simple as that, right? Machiavelli is not fatalist, although he believes that you cannot control your situation always. There are, might be circumstances that you cannot control. It's all about having skills, and Cesare Borgia definitely had the skills to play this kind of game, but also having skills that are a good match to a changing set of circumstances. So Cesare Borgia, from that point of view, had the skills that were required to play the first part of his game. But when the circumstances changed and a different game needed to be played at the time of his father's demise, when the, the game was not a military game anymore, but the game was who's going to be the next pope, who can influence the election of the next pope, but uh, Cesare Borgia did not have the necessary skills to play that game, and that's why it's played by Machiavelli. Now, we have to explain why Machiavelli, who, he, who could have mentioned that he was there and saw Ramiro's body, who could have inserted himself as a historical eyewitness in any part of the story leading to this point, why is Machiavelli only presenting himself as an actor in this story, in, in this uh, series of historical events, right at the end, when he says, he, Cesare Borgia, told me that he had thought of everything, but he would never think that when his father died, he would also be uh, very, very sick. And one of the posts, my, my explanation, of course, there are plenty of of books and articles written on this is that what is, if you think about it, what is the limitation? Uh, what is that brought down Cesare Borgia? The fact that 
his skills did not match the required skills, the issues, the critical problems that he faced at the moment of his father's death. What was, what could have been one way to uh, compensate for the lack of strategic skills to uh, play the game of influence for the uh, election of the Pope, because clearly you cannot kill a cardinal. Well, you, you can, but the price in terms of influence is very high. Uh, what would have been a remedy to this? Having with you, as a consigliere, in mafia terms, in Godfather's term, someone like Machiavelli, right? And having on board someone who can make up for some of the skills that you are missing, that can advise you uh, for this kind of game that is different from the kind of game that Cesare Borgia had played until that point, okay? So, it, and, and keep in mind that Machiavelli is writing this book for two reasons among many, not just to write about politics and political science, but he's writing this book to save Italy from a political and military crisis, to provide solutions. And the idea that you can apply force and influence, that you can deceit and manipulate people and also kill them, is just the suggestion that a solution for Italy needs to be a quick solution, and this is the kind of quick solution that could help. That, that Italy, the Italian states, don't have a lot of time. So they cannot just use influence with diplomacy, and they're not strong enough to use just force, so they have to combine those two. The best way to combine force is to use manipulation and deceit, combining force and influence. The second reason why Machiavelli writes this book is that he wants to go back to a political career, and therefore he has to suggest, not in an overt way, because at that point, you disqualify yourself, right? You, you cannot go to a job interview yourself and, and say to uh, your prospective employer, hire me because I'm the best candidate. Mm, doesn't work. It, it really uh, uh, is a losing proposition. You have to suggest that. You have to imply that. And Machiavelli is implying to the Medici's, look, even Cesare Borgia might have benefited who was stronger than any leader from, from that time might have benefited from external skills, from outsourcing some of his decisions and strategies. Therefore, you need someone like me. Okay? So keep that in mind. And uh, that was uh, my, uh, my analysis of chapter 7, which leaves me with not so much time. So I'll go, instead of chapter eight, I'll switch to the page on the paper and continue with my presentation of it. So I've already shown you that there is a list of books you can pick from, but keep in mind that for your final paper, which is a Machiavellian book report, if you want to call it that way, Keep in mind that not every book here is equally suited, okay? However, many of those books are also present, uh, uh, available on Amazon or in libraries. So have a look at the sample of the book. Or if you find it in the library, have a look at the book before you decide. You have to be comfortable with the analysis. And there might be other titles that are not included here. In that case, you just have to run the alternative title by me. And unless you have a brilliant template in mind, something that is perfect for the book you want to analyze, I strongly advise and strongly recommend that you follow this template because it, 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 it should produce the best possible results in, in terms of the grade. So this is the format that I suggest to uh, have an introduction where you talk about the book, if information about the book is available. This is not something that you develop in the same way. It very much depends on who the author is, who the book is, and I've provided an example based on the suit, 
which is kind of a silly representative in this category, very well made because the author is smart, but it's about fashion. It's about fashion and influence. It's kind of a parody of The Prince. But I didn't want to, you, you can also choose the suit, but I didn't want to uh, uh, do your work in reference to other books that might be more suitable, such as The 48 Laws of Power, right? And, and uh, be leading in my demonstration more than it is necessary. So whatever the book, see if you have any information about the reception of the book, right? Which could be formal reviews, actual reviews that appeared on the New York Times, on the Washington Post, etc., the LA Times. There are a lot of newspapers that offer digital archives, and some of these digital archives are either free or you have access to a few free articles before you need a subscription. So you can go that way. If there is no formal review, which might be the case for some of the books on the list, you might find informal reviews, blogs reviewing the book, or you might find forums discussing that book. And we don't need to know whether it's a good book or a bad book, whether it's poorly written or uh, entertaining. We especially want to appreciate whether or not the readers, the target audience for that book, got the gist of the Machiavellian representation of the themes in the book and what they had to say, what was their perception of the relevance of Machiavelli in this book. If you know who the author is, you can explain, you can uh, tell something about the, the author, right? Uh, as, as I did for Robert Greene or uh, for Harry Rubin. But the most important part in this case is not C, is D. That is to say, do we have any interviews or do we have an introduction to the book or a page in the book where the author tells why he picked Machiavelli as a model? why he was inspired by Machiavelli. And this can be inside the book or can be outside the book. Take Robert Greene. You go on YouTube and you find probably hundreds at this point of interviews. Uh, in some of them, he talks about Machiavelli. He talks about the 48 laws of power. Is there anything in any of those videos that you can capture and summarize or quote in your paper to make it focused and more relevant? Because the best thing the worst thing for this paper is to be generic, and the best thing is to include specific content. So the introduction altogether should not be very long, right? You need to preserve a balance. But depending on the book and the author, the introduction might be one paragraph, because there is very little about the author and very little about its reception in terms of reviews or reactions. But in some cases, even including quotes from Amazon reviewers or good read readers uh, might be significant if they have something smart to say or something that is representative of a large group of uh, generalized reaction to the book. So in some instances, the introduction might be one paragraph, even a short paragraph at that. And in some instances, it could be a page or two pages. I wouldn't go more than that. Then you have a section where you describe the book. Because you don't, of course, you don't provide a comprehensive analysis of the whole book in the paper. Eventually, for the core of the paper, you have to focus on a few passages. But in this section, you have room to explain what the book is about in general. How the book is made, what is the design of the book, what are the range of topics in the book, so that whatever examples you then focus on in the most important part, that is number three, it is placed within a frame, okay? 